Let's see number 71. Hymn number 71. I stand amazed in the face of Jesus of Nazarene. Wonder how he could love me, a sinner, condemned, unclean, and so on. Hymn number 71. I stand amazed in the presence of Jesus of Nazarene and wonder how he could love me a sinner and Oh 
continuing each night at the same time at 7.30, and then on Lord's Day, of course, it's an hour earlier at 6.30. And before we open the scriptures together, we'll speak to the Lord in prayer. Our God and Heavenly Father, we would bow in thy presence now. We do thank thee for that one uh, who uh, we would seek to present in the gospel tonight, even our Lord Jesus Christ. We bless thee, Father, that he ever came to this world and was born there in Bethlehem. We thank thee, Father, for the perfections of the life that he lived, sinless and holy and undefiled. Not only did he not sin, but he could not sin. He was God manifest in the flesh. And yet, O oh God, it pleased thee uh, to pour out upon him all of the wrath of God, against our sin that was his purpose in coming that he might pay that awful price and that the righteousness of god would be upheld in forgiving lost hopeless sinners who come by the blood for cleansing so lord we just commend ourselves to thee tonight that eyes and ears might be opened and the heart of understanding as well to receive the good news of the gospel as we read from the scriptures together concerning our Lord Jesus Christ, we would commend each and every one to thee. We pray for those tonight that are sick and sorrowing, and we just ask thee, Lord, to draw near to them. We think of even some in this assembly that are dealing with uh, sickness and sorrow. And we just ask thee to draw near in comfort and build them up in the most holy faith and draw them closer to thyself. We ask these things in the name of the Lord Jesus. Amen. Now we're going to read together tonight in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew's Gospel and chapter 27. Gospel of Matthew and chapter 27. <clears throat> and we'll begin reading at verse 15, Matthew 27, verse 15, now at that feast, the governor was wont to release unto the people a prisoner whom they would. They had then a notable prisoner called Barabbas. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said unto them, whom will ye that I release unto you? Barabbas? For Jesus, which is called Christ. For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife sent unto him, saying, Have thou nothing to do with that just man? For I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. But the chief priests and elders persuaded the multitude that they should ask Barabbas, and destroy Jesus. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twain will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Pilate saith unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? They all say unto him, Let him be crucified. And the governor said, Why? What evil hath he done? But they cried out, the more saying, let him be crucified. When Pilate saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, he took water and washed his hands before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. Then answered all the people and said, his blood be on us and on our children. Then released he Barabbas unto them, and when he had scourged Jesus, he delivered him to be crucified. 
Now the Lord will read, will bless the reading of his precious word uh, tonight. Whenever I read this account in Matthew's gospel of the uh, trial of the Lord Jesus and the response of, of Pontius Pilate, uh, it is just really heartbreaking to see how they handled the Lord of life and glory. The one who created the heavens and the earth. Pilate knew what was going on. Pilate wasn't deceived. He wasn't in the dark as to what was happening. He knew that for envy, they had delivered the Lord Jesus. He was pure. They were not. He was holy and undefiled. They were not. The people thronged him. They didn't throng them, these religious rulers. There was jealousy, there was envy, and there was an unwillingness to face their own deep need as sinners. They were hypocrites as well, through and through. Pilate knew all those things. He had interviewed the Lord Jesus. He knew that the Lord Jesus, uh, there was no fault in him. He couldn't find anything in the Lord Jesus. And now standing before this mob, he asks them a question. In verse 22, what shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? That is a question that every single person in this meeting needs to face tonight. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ. I am convinced that your eternal soul hangs in the balance tonight, depending on how you answer that very simple question. It will determine whether you spend eternity in heaven or down in hell in the lake of fire. You hang in the balance tonight. On this question, what shall I then do with Jesus, which is called Christ? Have you answered that question yet? Every single person must answer that question. There's a couple of other questions that we might uh, want to ask before we get back to this question. Questions that just spring to mind whenever we think of, of what Pilate said. The first one would be, well, what can the sinner do with Jesus anyway? What can the sinner do with Jesus? If we were to turn to the book of Acts, we would read that he was uh, delivered uh, by the determinate uh, counsel and foreknowledge of God to these very events that are all unfolding in Matthew chapter 27 and 28, where he was to be crucified and slain and to provide that uh, way of salvation. And so there's a divine purpose that is involved here. And we look at Pontius Pilate, and you might say, well, he was given the option of either releasing the Lord Jesus or delivering him to be crucified. Did he really have a choice? After all, we read about the determinate foreknowledge knowledge and, and counsel of God that he was to go to Calvary. Did Pilate really have a choice? I believe that as a responsible and as a rational human being, Pontius Pilate had a choice. He did. His own wife warned him. We read that as this was unfolding, she sends a message to the judgment seat saying, have thou nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. Now, we're not told the contents of that dream. Wouldn't it be great to know exactly what that dream was? I don't know if that will be revealed to us uh, in heaven, those of us that are on the way to heaven in a coming day, I'm not sure. But I've often wondered what kind of a dream was that anyway? This wife of Pontius Pilate, she understood that he was a righteous, a just man. That he did not deserve 
what was about to, to unfold and what they were crying for and clamoring for. Crucify him. And she tells her husband, out of concern, don't have anything to do with this. What was her vote? Release him. No other conclusion you could come to. Release him. Pilate gets the message and looks at it. You know, he's a very important man in the kingdom in the Roman Empire. This is just a note from his wife. She's not sitting on the seat of judgment. She has no authority whatsoever. And here are all these religious rulers with all of their authority clamoring for the death of the Lord Jesus. Who's he going to listen to? He had a choice. He really had a choice. What is he going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? I wonder, what are you going to do with him tonight? The Bible is full of, of questions like that concerning the Lord Jesus. Who hath believed his report? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? In Isaiah 53 and verse 1. We know that throughout the Bible, men and women are challenged to face the reality of what they will do with the Lord Jesus. What have you done with him? Oh, you say, I learned about him when I was a kid in Sunday school. I know Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. I have sung about him, I've read about him, and uh, uh, I do uh, love the Lord Jesus. People might even say that, even though they've never, ever faced their need as a sinner. The question is tonight, are you going to accept him as your savior? Have you ever realized how lost you really are? These religious people around the Lord Jesus, these Pharisees and Sadducees and lawyers and scribes who were all taught and immersed in the Old Testament scriptures, they didn't want the Lord Jesus. They didn't want the Messiah. So it doesn't really mean very much, does it, to know all about him if you're not going to take him as your savior. Doesn't really mean very much at all to know who he was and yet live your life as if he didn't exist. The purpose of a gospel meeting is that you might face the reality that this man that stands before you tonight, the Lord Jesus Christ, he demands an answer. What are you going to do with Jesus, which is called the Christ? Here's another question we could ask. Who's going to decide this question for me? Who is going to decide this question for me? Pilate, in his heart, made certain determinations about the Lord Jesus. He decided that he was a just man. I think he, uh, he had no problem coming to that conclusion after examining him. He wanted to release the Lord Jesus and send Barabbas to his death as a criminal. He was trying to give the people uh, the choice and hoping they would make the right choice. But the final responsibility was in his hands. You know, in a sense, the final responsibility tonight is in your hands. What are you going to do with the Lord Jesus? Now, I know there are some that would say, well, uh, you know, the Spirit of God, he's going to decide that one way or the other. No, that's, that's not scriptural. I do not believe that to be scriptural. The Spirit of God moves in the hearts and in the lives of individuals. The Spirit of God can awaken through circumstances and and the prayers of the Lord's people and the preaching of the word of God and other things at his disposal. He can awaken desires within us. But the final decision, the final determination of what am I going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ is in your hands. You can accept him or you can reject him. Adam wasn't coerced anything into anything in the Garden of Eden. Neither was Eve. Eve was deceived. But Adam wasn't coerced. 
He wasn't forced into taking that fruit and, and disobeying God blatantly and openly. He made a choice. He made a determination, a decision. And you can go all through your Bible and see how man have gone their own way. Mankind have chosen their own pathway. And were it not for the Spirit of God crossing that pathway and, and, and bringing people up short and, and bringing things to their attention, every one of us would be on the road to hell tonight. There'd be no salvation for anybody. Thank God the Spirit of God works in this world. And I believe the Spirit of God was working in Pilate's heart. Things that were brought to his attention, even the circumstance concerning his own wife. Bringing this warning to him. But who's going to make the decision? Nobody can make it by proxy. Mom and dad can't make this decision for you. Neither can your brother or your sister or the preacher or a Sunday school teacher. Nobody can make this determination but you. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? He heard the voices of the world all around him. You know what the problem is tonight in Rexdale? It's the same problem that Pontius Pilate faced. The clamoring voices of the world. All around us. Criticizing the Lord Jesus. Trying to run him down. Trying to tear down anything that is, that is holy and sacred. Trying to turn the hearts of men and women away from him. Listen to the voices of the world and the clamoring crowd. You'll lose your soul. It's as simple as that. Sadly, that's exactly what Pontius Pilate did. He listened to the clamoring voices of the world. Oh, I know the high school is full of those kinds of voices. So are the universities. So is the workplace. Even in family circles, there are voices that will be raised against you and against the Lord Jesus. But you have to answer this question in your own soul. Pilate went on to do a very pathetic thing. The action that he took, I can't think of a better word than pathetic. He takes a basin of water in front of them. It says there in verse 24, when he saw that he could prevail nothing, but that rather a tumult was made, but I'm thinking to myself, wait a minute, Pilate, you have Roman legions at your disposal. <laughs> You could put this down. You could crush this very quickly. If this is the way these rebellious and gainsaying people want to do, uh, want to go, they want to tr uh, uh, trample Roman justice under their boots, under their sandals, send in the legions. That's what Rome did. Crush them. Make them realize that Roman justice will prevail. But you see, this was the Lord Jesus. This was one of their own. He's in a delicate situation in his mind. And so he thinks, this is how, how I'll get off the hook. Takes a basin of water. And takes his hands and washes them before the multitude, saying, I am innocent of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. What a statement. What an action to take. I would suggest that basin of water was likely sitting on a little pedestal or a little dais. And there placed upon that, full of water, with a rabble mob all around, numbering in the thousands. This was no small crowd of 50 or 100 people. This would very likely be into the thousands of people. With the religious leaders egging them on and putting words in their mouth. As that basin is placed there, I can just sense the, the silence that would have settled over that crowd. Pilate uttered these words, I am innocent, as he's washing his hands of the blood of this just person. See ye to it. What was their answer? His blood be upon, be upon us and upon our children. This is one of the most 
blatant, rebellious statements in the word of God. I would put it at number one. And the consequences were far reaching. But let's just stick with Pilate for a minute. Many years ago, I saw a picture I've never forgotten. I'd like to find, find it again. It was a picture of Pontius Pilate depicting him uh, standing there in this courtyard. And in front of him is the basis, the, the basin on that little pedestal. And he's wringing his hands over the basin. When I first saw it, two or three things kind of missed my attention, but then I, I caught the details. In the background, there were just like swirls of darkness. He stood out in, in bold relief there with the basin, wringing his hands. And underneath it are these words, will they ever be clean? Will they ever be clean? I stared at that picture for a while, and then I noticed something. There's no water dripping from his hands. There's no water in the basin. This was a depiction by that artist of Pontius Pilate in hell, crying out in anguish, Will they ever be clean? And underneath it were these words written, No, Pilate, they will never be clean. He gave the wrong answer to his own question. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? He made the wrong decision. He delivered them, verse 26 delivered him to be crucified. I wonder tonight in this meeting, what is your response going to be to this solemn question? What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? You've thought of it. You've considered it. It's been on your mind. Should I get saved? Should I go ahead with this? Should I go in for it? I'm thankful for those who come back night after night to gospel meetings because I believe that is an indication that the Spirit of God is working. And, I, and we pray that your heart might be touched and that you might realize that this is the most important thing that I could ever do. It's more important than my education. It's more important than a, a career in this world. It's more important than getting married or any of the other things that a person could uh, spend their time at or indulge in, in this world, here is an issue that is going to stay with you, its consequences for all eternity. How you answer this question is going to determine your eternal destiny. That's how important it is. There's no other question that you'll have to answer anywhere near as important as this one. And so all we can do is hold him up before you. The Lord Jesus, the meek and lowly one. The one who said, who proclaimed himself to be a shepherd, the good shepherd that giveth his life for the sheep. The one who said, I am the bread of life. The one who said, I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved. The one who said, I am the light. I am the, the way, the truth, and the life. And we could go on and on describing all of the attributes and the qualities of our Lord Jesus Christ. The greatest work that was ever done on the face of this earth was when that meek, holy Lamb of God was nailed to a cross and became sin for us that we might be saved wonder, is that enough for you tonight? You might look at Pontius Pilate and say, but wait a minute, he didn't know how it was all going to unfold. You might say, well, Pilate didn't have really that clear of, of, a, of, of, the, of knowledge or, or understanding of what was happening there and who the Lord Jesus really was and what he was about to accomplish. You can make those arguments. He still made the wrong choice. 
But you in the meeting tonight, you're not in that position. You know all about it. You've heard these things from the word of God. And now you're faced with a dilemma. What am I going to do with the Lord Jesus Christ? I hope that those words will just ring in your mind tonight when you go home from this meeting or before this meeting comes to an end. That it will keep going over and over in your mind. What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called the Christ? I hope you make the right decision. I hope you give the right answer. I hope you come to him tonight as a lost, hell-deserving sinner. And just prostrate yourself before him. Take him as your Savior and Lord. That's what salvation is all about. Come to Christ tonight. I'm going to close with a little verse in Matthew chapter 11. It's the words of the Lord Jesus. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I will give you rest. In the Gospel of Luke, chapter twenty three. <clears throat> the Gospel of Luke. And we're reading in chapter 27. And we'll read verse 18. <clears throat> Luke chapter 23, pardon me, verse 44. Luke chapter 23 and verse 44. And it was about the sixth hour, and there was a darkness over all the earth until the ninth hour, the darkness of the cross. Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> the epistle of Hebrews chapter 2. <clears throat> read verse 14. Hebrews chapter 2 and verse 14. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he, that is, the Lord Jesus Christ, also himself likewise took part of the same that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil, the defeat of the cross. John chapter 19. The 19th chapter of the Gospel of John, and we'll read verse 30. John chapter 19 and verse 30. When Jesus therefore had received the vinegar, he said, it is finished. And he bowed his head and gave up the ghost, the victory of the cross. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, we'll read verse 32. John chapter 12 and verse 32. And I, this is the Lord Jesus speaking, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me the attraction of the cross. Finally, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. And verse 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God, the foolishness of the cross, to them that perish. I want to draw your attention in a closing moment of this gospel meeting to the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. I want to consider for a few moments some aspects of that cross. It is a subject that is inexhaustible. 
That is, it is vast. I'm just going to touch a few points on the cross tonight. There is no event that has ever been reported historically that is more accurate, more true, more definite than the record that is given to us of the cross and of what the Lord Jesus Christ suffered on that cross. I would expect that everyone in this meeting tonight has a picture in your mind of a cross. But the picture that you have in your mind of a cross may not be the picture of the cross or the cross that is found in the Bible. The cross in the Bible was not overlaid with gold or silver or inlaid with precious stones to make it look attractive. That's not the cross in the Bible. The cross in the Bible, and the hymn writer was quite accurate, on the hill far away stood an old rugged cross. And on that cross, the Lord Jesus Christ was crucified. I want you to think with me for a few moments as we have indicated the darkness of the cross. When we come to the New Testament, we have much that is recorded about the abuse of the Lord Jesus at the hands of wicked men. There is very little recorded in the New Testament relative to the darkness of the cross. It is perhaps that the Apostle Paul was getting very close when he recorded the words, he hath made him to be sin for us, for you know sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. And likely Peter was getting close, for Christ also has suffered the just for the unjust that he might bring us to God. Think in your thinking just for a moment tonight then of those hours of darkness at Calvary when I have said the darkness of the cross. Those are hours that are indescribable. That is, there is no human mind can fathom. No human tongue can explain the awful darkness of those hours that the Lord Jesus hung upon that cross. When the billows of God's wrath rolled over him, the wave after wave of the wrath of God was his portion at Calvary. The wormwood, the gall, the terrible suffering in those hours of darkness. They were indescribable. And God hid that scene in darkness for a purpose that no eye, no human eye, would ever pierce the darkness of Calvary. No eye saw the Savior suffer in the darkness of that cross. We sometimes sing, Oh, wondrous hour, when Jesus, thou go equal with the eternal God, beneath our sins did stay to bow. And in our stand, did spare the rod. That is, in that darkness, when the waves and the billows of the wrath of God was poured out upon the Lord Jesus Christ in those three hours at Calvary, human tongue cannot express, nor human heart, nor the mind of men enter in to the awfulness of the darkness of Calvary. He bore the wrath of God in those terrible hours upon that cross. The foundation of eternal peace was laid in three hours of darkness at the place called Calvary. I want to make this statement again tonight. I think I've made it once before. That it is not the purpose of God that you should spend eternity in hell and in the lake of fire. God has done everything that could be done that your soul might be saved, that you might trust Christ, that you might find the way to heaven, the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if you find yourself in hell, it is because you rejected him, because you turned your back upon him. The prophet Isaiah in the book of Lamentation says, is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by, behold and see, if there be any sorrow like unto my sorrow, which is done unto me, 
wherewith the Lord hath afflicted me in the day of his fierce anger. That is, God in heaven afflicted his son with his fierce anger in those three hours of darkness at Calvary to provide a way for sinners to get to heaven, for sinners to have a Savior who died for them, who suffered for them. So the question is, what will you do with Jesus? What will the answer be? The Savior suffered the darkness of Calvary. We have read the defeat of the cross and, and destroy or defeat him. That is Satan. The greatest battle of the ages was never fought on the battlefields of man. The greatest battle of the ages was fought in three hours of darkness at Calvary. When Satan and in all of his power arrayed against a sufferer crucified on a cross. And we have read in Hebrews chapter 3 that he was defeated. That is, Satan was defeated by the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary. That was the greatest battle that was ever fought. When most and Satan's awful power, O oh Lord, thy suffering spirit seemed there in that dark and lonely hour. Our souls were by thy body. God has done everything to provide a way to heaven for you by the sending of the Son, by his Son going to Calvary. We have heard Pilate say that he washed his hands. Pilate, when he made that statement, and I think we will remind it, that when the Jews say, his blood be on us and our children, they have paid a terrible price for that statement until this present moment. Satan wants your soul down in hell. He will do everything that he can within his power to deceive you, to lead you along the broad way on this chart, and that you might perish eternally. Hell, the lake of fire, but God has done everything needed that your soul can be in heaven. And so here in the darkness of a cross, and again, the prophet asked the question, is it nothing to you? So search your soul tonight. Ask yourself the question. Search your soul deeply tonight. Is it nothing to you? Does Calvary, does the sufferings of the Son of God, of the Lord Jesus Christ on that cross, does that mean anything to you? Does it stir your soul with a note of thankfulness? And a note of worship because there was a man who suffered on that cross for me. Is it nothing to you? All ye that pass by? And in a, a gospel meeting, the purpose is that again you should pass by the cross. You should consider again the death of the Lord Jesus on that cross. You should think of his sufferings for you and of what he bore, the awful judgment for your sin in those hours of terrible suffering at Calvary. We have said, as we read the words in John 19, finished, that is the victory of the cross. Work is finished. You have nothing to do. I think we sing a hymn, cast your deadly doing down, set it aside, all of your efforts, all that you think you can do to get to heaven, all of your trying, all of your trying to live a good life, whatever it might be, just set it all aside, everything by the board tonight. There's only one issue that you need to face tonight. It's a man suffering on a cross outside the walls of Jerusalem. I, I love the poet. From Salem's gates advancing slow, when object beats my gaze, what mean those mingled cries? What means the mingled cries? And then the poet said, Who is this who groans beneath yon ponderous cross of wood? Whose souls are well with thoughts of death? Whose body's bathed in blood? Is this the man? Can this be he? The prophets have foresold. Should with transgressors number be, and for my crimes be sold? 
I want you to think of the last few lines of that poem that I just quoted. The poet said, oh, lovely sight for a hip, oh, lovely sight for, oh, heavenly form, for sinful eyes to see. I'll creep beside him as a worm and see he died for me. That is, as a worm, as a sinner. Beside him, my eyes are occupied with a man on the cross. And I'll see that that man on the cross, he died for me. That's what salvation is. That the sinner sets everything else aside. And they're occupied with a man who suffered upon the cross. In those lonely hours, the truth fills the soul, occupies the soul, enlightens the mind, if you will. He died for me. Every person on the way to heaven has that ringing in their, in their soul. They'll never forget the moment that they saw for the first time. It was for me. It was all for me. Love of God. So great, so free. He died for me. My Lord, the King. That's what salvation is. When a soul comes to the moment of their life, when they realize that the man on the cross, when he cried, finished, that the work was all complete, nothing left for you to do. It has been finished. And God in heaven is satisfied with all that his son accomplished on the cross. I made the statement that it was not God's purpose that you should perish and be in hell. He indicated that, and he indicates it very loudly by a cross, by his son hanging on that cross. The verse above my head again says, God so loved the world. What is love? I asked a group of Chinese people what love was to give me a synonym for love. One of the women, women very quickly gave me the correct answer. The only way, the only way, I emphasize, the only way that love can be seen is by what it does. Not what it says, what it does. And God has manifested his love for you by what he has done, said his son. The son that he loved. And he sent his son knowing that the son would dwell for a very short time on this earth and would be taken by wicked hands and stood before a Roman judge, Pilate, that we've been hearing about. And Pilate would give the sentence that he should be crucified. God gave his son to that death because there's a God in heaven who loves your soul. And the love of God is so great that he would give his son to die for you to finish the work of the cross that you might know for certain that you're going to be in heaven by receiving him and him alone. And so the, <clears throat> the darkness of the cross, what darkness when the wrath of God was poured out upon the Lord Jesus and again, the prophet describes that from above, thou hast sent fire, this is Zechariah, from above thou hast sent fire into my bones, and it prevails against them. That fire was the fire of God's terrible judgment. Two thieves were crucified. They experienced the death of crucifixion as the Lord Jesus did, but they never experienced what the Savior suffered in the hours of darkness. We have heard about the one thief who heard the Savior say, Today thou shalt be with me in paradise. He had accepted Christ. The other thief, for those few hours that he hung upon the cross, that was suffering. But that's nothing compared to where he is now, having rejected Christ. And now he's suffering eternally. And that suffering which he is suffering now 
fades almost into nothing compared to what he suffered on the cross. What he is suffering now, the darkness of the cross. That darkness was when the Savior bore the judgment of sin. And souls who are saved here tonight can say, he bore the judgment of my sin. He defeated Satan at the cross. The victory was won. And the attraction of the cross, isn't it a tremendous thing? <clears throat> when we think of the cross, when we think of what it really means to the Lord Jesus and what it means to God, isn't it a solemn thing? And to those who are perishing in their sins, I hope there's no one here tonight. And this is the attitude of your soul. Those who are perishing in their sins think that the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. I hope that you're thinking tonight, even if you're not saved, I hope you're thinking tonight, this is the greatest message that you could ever hear. You may not be listening to the greatest preachers tonight, but it's the greatest message all same. The greatest message, Christ crucified at the place called Calvary for you to bear the judgment of your sins, I hope. That is not foolishness to you. It was mighty love's constraining power that made the blessed Savior die. It was love in that tremendous hour that triumphed in thy mighty cry. You understand tonight that there's nothing you have to do. Do you realize tonight that everything has been done? Set everything aside tonight. Clear everything out of the way tonight. All that, that, that fills your mind thinking I can do just a little. There's just a little I can do. You're helpless. We don't like to feel that way, do we? We like to feel that we've got our hands on the wheel, so to speak. We like to feel that there's something that we can do. We like to feel that we have a little control. You have no control here. Only one that's worth knowing right now is the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who died on that cross. There is no sweeter message that could ever be poured into the ear of those who are in their sins. Many years ago, even before I was commended to the Lord's work, we had a tent in a place called Stainer. There were a good number of people who came to that tent. And I didn't know this until just a short time ago. I was sitting at a table with a number of believers and we were discussing the day that we were saved. And I heard this man say that he was saved in that tent. I didn't know that. Sometimes things kind of come back and cause a more of a rejoicing in your soul that he sat in that tent. And that's where he was saved. Some of you would know him if I give you his name. What about you? Has there been a time that you can look back to in your life, in your soldiering here upon this earth? Has there been a moment, a time, when you realized that the lovely man on the cross, out of love for my soul, took my place? became my substitute, bore what I should bear at the place called Calvary, that I might be delivered from my sins, that I might be saved. At a phone call, I told some of the Christians this already. A good long time ago, I taught history with another man. He had opportunity to come to a gospel Recording meeting. Recording in history. progress. Now, of all the years have run the course, and the phone is ringing, Margaret heard the phone call. And he was reminding me about the years that we spent together teaching. He would never come to a gospel meeting. But then, to my joy, he said, I have heard you preach. And I'm wondering, where do you hear me preach? Well, you know, you can get on that computer and there are some useful things that that computer can be used for. 
and he got on the computer and he got my name up and he got some messages that I preached. I don't know whether he ever got saved. I hope he did. What about you tonight? If you were wise tonight, you set every other thought out of your mind. And you would consider earnestly the most important issue that you will ever face. And that important issue is, what are you going to do with the man who died on the cross for you? Are you going to receive him and leave a meeting like this? I'm not telling you to go home and think it over. I think it was, I forget the Moody, was it, who preached that message in Chicago and told the audience to go home and think it over. And that night, the fire raged through the downtown area of Chicago. And it's likely that some of the people that Mr. Moody told to go home and think it over perished in that fire. No, I'm not telling you to go home and think it over. I'm telling you, now is the accepted time now is the day of salvation. This present moment, sitting in this gospel hall, is the moment that God has given you. You have no guarantee that you'll ever arrive home tonight. None of us have. We live in very uncertain times, in a very uncertain world. This is the opportunity that God has given to you to receive his son that he sent to die for you, to suffer for you. And to please call I'm going to get on the hip just a little bit. Our Father, in our Savior's name, we are thankful for the Savior. And while we have been reminded of Pilate and of the demand that the Jewish people had that he should be crucified, that we believe that God sent him and that he was prepared in the garden to go to the place called Calvary. And that he died upon that cross, bearing the judgment of God. We thank thee for every soul here who knows him and has received him as their savior. But our Father, we pray for any who came into this hall tonight, strangers to the grace of God. We pray that they might not leave in the same condition that they came in, that they might receive the savior tonight. I know and rejoice that he died for them, that he suffered for them at Calvary, and that that work is finished. Thus I will be pray, my word and pray in his name. Amen. Amen. I will go sing a hymn. <clears throat> I'm going to sing the whole hymn tonight. Number 101, hymn number 101.